It's been dubbed the gender revolution. And if you're listening from anywhere in the West, you see it everywhere. Gender identity has been disconnected from biology. And what you feel about your body matters more than what you can see and what you can touch. Even children encouraged to believe that they were born into the wrong gendered body now expect and sometimes even demand support from parents and other authorities as they seek life-altering drugs and surgeries to, quote, confirm the gender with which they identify. For almost a decade, I've fielded questions from concerned parents, friends, and pastors about this gender revolution. And that's why I'm glad that Samuel Ferguson has written the booklet, Does God Care About Gender Identity? One of the first in a new series from the Gospel Coalition and Crossway called Hard Questions. The other new titles are Why Do We Feel Lonely at Church by Jeremy Linneman and Is Christianity Good for the World by Sharon James. You can buy these booklets anywhere, including Amazon, just $70.99 a piece. But you get the best deal at the Gospel Coalition store where you can purchase three copies for the price of two. Uh, Samuel Ferguson has been the rector of the Falls Church Anglican in Falls Church, Virginia since 2019. I first saw him writing on gender dysphoria all the way back in a 2015 book review for the Gospel Coalition. He also contributed to our 2022 article, Transformation of a Transgender Teen by Sarah Zalstra. He joins me on Gospel Bound to discuss this cultural revolution and address everything from parents to pronouns to the distressing experience of gender dysphoria. Sam, thank you for joining me on Gospel Bound. Thank you for having me, Colin. It's an honor to get to spend some time with you. All right, Sam, when did you first notice that something significant had changed in our culture? I first noticed um, this shift when I was in graduate school in England in 2010 and 2011 when a classmate of mine, um, a self-proclaimed agnostic, um, opened up to me about his own gender confusion and told me that he was in a process of transitioning. And at that time, um, 2010, 2011, it actually wasn't in the news all the time. Um, and it certainly was something that, that I didn't have experience with personally. And walking with this friend, we really were friends, we were classmates, um, was the first occasion I had to not just think about it theoretically, but also personally. Now, I wonder, wonder Sam, you're a pastor, and in many ways that brings you up close and personal to a lot of these questions. But at the same time, it might actually make other people wonder, why are you actually qualified <laughs> to talk about yeah. these things? Just because you, you've known some people or had some friends who've experienced this, they, uh, they might be thinking, well, what are you going to do? You're just going to quote Genesis 1:27 at me and, and call it good. So, I mean, is this something that you anticipated that you were going to have to, to work through in pastoral ministry? Do you, do you have a class on this? And just tell us a little bit more about what your study has looked like. Yeah, that's a great question, Colin. I mean, you wouldn't want your pastor to prescribe chemotherapy to you. Um, and so as a pastor, you do have to be careful to stay in your lane. Um, but really, nobody's in the lane of the transgender movement. It's so new. And in seminary, you don't have classes on this. Um, biblical anthropology, which is the technical term for the study of being human according to scripture and theology, is really an underdeveloped area. And so coming into pastoral work, I certainly didn't anticipate or feel prepared to help parents and help young people deal with the question of gender confusion. It was so new. And I, I think what pastors need to be able to do, however, is, is get underneath a cultural conversation and try to understand it in terms of the core beliefs it assumes. I mean, every, every, every movement or ideology assumes a certain worldview. There's hidden premises about what it means to be human, about what you do with pain, about where you find happiness. And that's certainly true of the transgender movement. So as a pastor, I have felt I've had to think through this deeply with people and then go to scripture with fresh eyes, looking at old texts that I've looked at before, like Genesis 1, 2, and 3, accounts of the resurrection. You know, was Jesus embodied? Yes. Did he have a male body? Yes. What does that mean for how we think of our present body? 
and basically create a, an architecture for being gendered as an embodied being that could help people think through how they would analyze the current debate in terms of treatments and really what is biblical in terms of where our gender is located and whether or not we can change it. So in short, Colin, I didn't come into pastoral ministry wanting to talk about this or feeling that I'd been prepared, um, but it's it's always come up in personal situations for me with with real people and real families, and I haven't had anywhere to send people. Um, there's very little written on it, um, and quite frankly, I feel like you can't hand you can't hand your church members over to culture on this one right now. Um, and so I've I've tried to do my best humbly to, to dig into scripture and, and offer some insights. It seems a little odd, uh, Sam, that you'd say something as important as biblical anthropology hasn't really been addressed as much as it should. Is that simply because that's the way theology develops and it's always responding or dealing with contemporary issues at different times? Um, or is that reveal a kind of a broader weakness or how do you account for that i think um doctrine and theology they, they don't develop in a vacuum they typically develop in relation to heresies or false teaching or questions and so you know without realizing it you know the council of nicaea and some of the early councils when they were dealing on the nature of christ were getting close to anthropology right um, but it was from a different angle how is Christ fully God and fully man? And and the questions then during the Reformation were around soteriology, what does it mean to be saved, the nature of the Bible, the nature of authority. Um, and then I think more recently in some of the debates between faith and science, um, we've maybe wondered about the nature of the world and how we understand it from the Bible. And I think anthropology has been there in different conversations, but it's come to the fore in a new way where where we have to ask questions about embodiment and what does it mean to have a body and what does it mean to be male or female vis-a-vis -vis your body and i just don't think we've ever had to ask the question with the same cultural pressure that we do now i mean the, the notion that you could be born as a girl trapped in a male body that 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 even that idea was completely nonsensical up till about ten years ago, and now it's commonplace. So I think it's it's the cultural situation um, has just forced us to think more deeply about anthropology. Sam, should we be surprised that this seems to correspond to the ubiquity of the internet? No, I I think the the speed at which ideas spread now. Um, because of the internet is obviously uh, a lot faster. And so I think you're more likely, well, I should rephrase that, you, you're you less likely to be able to duck an issue just because you might not be in a, you know, a coastal city or in, in a town with a progressive school district. Everyone's going to be asking these questions, no matter what continent you're on or where you live in America. Not to mention if you're a if you're a teenager, a preteen, you're on TikTok, you're seeing all sorts of different messages come through there, examples, um, models from other people's lives, not to mention the fact that the internet itself seems to be a plausibility structure that makes disembodiment normal. Yeah. Um, we're less physical. We feel less physical than any time before because the internet makes our our lifestyle so sedentary in so many ways, and it also digitizes our work, um, mm -hmm. which also then androgenizes our work to a certain extent because it eliminates some of the inherent um, uh, sexual differences in terms of strength and things like that between men and women. So at least when I'm talking on the subject, it's often, it's not a coincidence, that, at least to me, that we're having this conversation in 2023 as opposed to 1993. Um, seems to be some significant developments there in the middle. But let's go back a little bit more into the kind of the nature of this dramatic and, as you've been pointing out here, Sam, a sudden change in Western culture. Um, do you see this simply as the logical extension of the sexual revolution and specifically with what we've seen for decades now with homosexuality? Or do you see something, or do you see this as a, a different branch 
does it come from that one or, or from somewhere else? That's a good question, Colin. Um, I, I would say that this is a, a manifestation of um, a deeper movement towards prizing the autonomous individual on the one hand, so personal yeah. freedom, and then moving towards intuitions or feelings yeah. to understand who you are. So kind of this Cartesian inward turn alongside the prizing of personal freedom. And so it's in some ways you can, once you start to see that that's the air we breathe, and then you start to see the obsession with identity that's playing out. I mean, I mean, everybody, what, what is your identity? And, and, and rather than being something you receive from external structures, family of origin, nationality, religion, uh, identity is very much a, a project of self-discovery now and self-expression, a do-it-yourself project, as Brian Rosner likes to say. It, it, yeah. Once you see that, you really start to just realize this could come up anywhere. Um, anything that seems to be limiting human expression. I mean, even the, even the notion that we're uh, have a species, a human, that that's, that's a biological reality. But once you turn identity into this nebulous feeling that you have, and then you prize the individual's autonomy over everyone else, you so suddenly see, a lot, see almost like the booby trap has been set. Yeah. And, and it's very, that's why I think talking about it is so hard because it feels like you're violating someone's personal freedom and denying their existence and their identity. Um, so I would say it, it developed over a period of time with a lot of philosophical underpinnings, was aided by the sexual revolution, was probably aided by a larger movement towards androgyny and how we understand gender roles. Um, I don't think that's unrelated. Like we, we've, we, when the same-sex marriage thing happened in 2015, what you saw was that marriage is no longer between a man and a woman; it's between two persons. Yeah. And once you realize that that we're persons, we're not men and women, you just start to see that a lot of these things come together to um, kind of undermine the idea of an embodied gender that limits your freedom of choice. I think that that's a really helpful explanation, Sam, of, of a lot of the continuities. I wonder here about one of the discontinuities that seems to be there in terms of the distinction between the, um, you know, the L, G, B, maybe, and the T um, in, the, in that description. So here's what I'm seeing, at least, and tell me if I'm wrong on this, but so much of the gay rights movement's momentum in the 1990s and the 2000s it seemed to gain traction on biological grounds. I'm simply born this way. You, you saw a lot of discussions, is there a gay gene? Or, or people are, they inherit this. We don't know how, but this is something that they can't change. It's an immutable characteristic of them. All we need to be able to do is strip away society's constraints. A Rousseau idea that we just need to get back to nature. Nature is biology, biology is genetics, genetics will someday reveal that some people are simply born same-sex attracted. But it seems like this gender revolution that you're writing about is actually pretty different. <laughs> it's fluid now. Yeah. And it's a triumph of psychology over biology. You don't hear anymore about the search of a mm -hmm. gay gene because that in and of itself, as you just pointed out, Sam, that also limits autonomy. Yeah. If you're telling somebody they're born this way, that they can only be attracted as a man to another man, that is, that is, that's very limiting, not to mention marriage there. Do you think I'm on the right track there? Or are there any other differences that you, that you might see? But it seems like some of the arguments about the transgender identity are quite different from what we heard for decades in gay rights. Absolutely, uh, Colin. I mean, the... the and I, I don't mean this just to be um, pejorative, but the, the movement is marked by profound incoherence. Um, so on the one hand, it can't define what a woman or a man is. And at the same time, a person can know inside that they're a woman or a man, um, but they can't define what that is. And, and then the movement's very concerned that a doctor would look at a baby based on their anatomy and chromosomes and assign it a sex at birth. But at the same time, as you said, the, the, the gay movement um, leveraged the notion that you could be born a certain way. And so, yeah, I mean, look, there's no, there's no agreed upon metaphysic behind this movement. There's no agreed upon notion that nature has meaning. 
And so you you have a deep incoherence here. And I think because the really the final authority is the self, you know, a very Nietzschean idea that you really it's the will to power, the will to the self to express itself is the core idea. Anything that would get in that way, even the idea that you were born gay, eventually will have to be jettisoned to say the self can be what it wants when it wants, as long as it doesn't encroach on another self's autonomy. And so I, I think the gender movement is is simply really a, a, a continual outworking of the deeper ideology under the LGBTQ movement. And that's why you see some 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 inner discord within the movement, even even how the transgender movement right now is sitting awkwardly alongside women's rights, particularly in the arena of sports. And these right. two things just sit awkwardly together. And um, so, yeah, I, I think there's incoherence here and, and there are differences. Yeah. Um, one of the, Jean Twenge is another one of my guests this season on Gospel Bound, and she wrote a new book called Generations. Um, people can listen to the interview and and uh, hear my perspective and her perspective on why I think that's such a significant book. And um, I think, though, the, the part that stood out to me the most was about Gen Z in that book. And we're talking here the generation behind millennials. These are teenagers up to uh, kind of early 20-somethings now. And a research indicated that more than half of Gen Z cannot conceive of there being only two sexes or genders. Um, in fact, it's, it's really inconceivable of them. One thought I'm having here, Sam, is you mentioned that the self has autonomy so long as it does not infringe upon the autonomy of another adjacent self. But that's not actually Nietzsche's conclusions. His was actually the will to rule over other self sure. <laughs> as the well will to power. Yeah, yeah Ubermensch, exactly as, yeah. as Dostoevsky had covered in Crime and Punishment, we've seen elsewhere. So it almost makes me wonder here, is there, um, as younger generations are coming forward, I, I'm wondering if there won't be that sort of live and let live, do your thing self, but actually more of an assertion of, of dominance as the younger generation loses any normative sense of mm -hmm. the givenness of biology or the broader cultural and familial norms over the course of, of millennia. It's kind of a wide-ranging thought, but do you have any, any sense of, of, of what differences you particular, particularly might see um, among Gen Z on this topic? Yeah, I, I think... Um... You know, I love the saying, reality has a way of sneaking up on you. And so even as the idea of, of a binary world of male, male and female becomes nonsensical to young people, we're all still born male or female, right? Um, and so I think there is, I believe in what's called gender essentialism, mean, meaning that your, your body does impact your gender identity. And I think, you know, I think that's significant in various ways. I know it's it's easy to fall into kind of cultural stereotypes for how that's played out. But I think what you're going to see, and you see some of it now, is you see some of these movements towards kind of classic masculinity. You could think of online personalities that have a lot of followers. And and you also could think of the recent Barbie movie, which has gotten some some backlash because it's predicated somewhat on the notion of a binary world, right? And um, and so many people went to see the Barbie movie, and I saw so many pictures of, of women dressing up in pink, re really playing into the cultural stereotype to go. And I, I was observing this thinking, you know, it's, it's hard to articulate what's going on, but there's something deep in these gender norms that I think we're going to see people, they're going to keep coming back to them. I think you'll see it with young men in the arena of sports in some situations. They're, they're, they're going to want to play football in a rough way. And, and so I, I do think there will probably be more space for talking about what is an appropriate kind of expression of masculinity or femininity, which are really important conversations. But there's got to be some anchor there. Um, I mean, the fact that a male gets a testosterone bath in utero and then gets a testosterone bath during puberty 
it has some type of effect that that I just think you can't cancel out. And so yeah, I, I think um, I think we'll have a lot of people who who won't ever say that they think there's only two genders. And then we're going to have a lot of people grasping to fit into some type of mold where they can feel like a woman or feel like a man. And that's just going to be an awkward situation. And I think it's going to be a real challenge for the church, Colin, in, in how we talk about what it means to be a man and what it means to be a woman. I think we have a lot of work to do. Not just in, not just in making the case that your body is your gender, but the harder question right now is going to be, okay, so what does it mean to be masculine? What does it mean to be feminine? And that relates to roles in the church, roles in the home, but also just these inclinations people have. And, and I think it's a hard question. What occurs to me, Sam, I hadn't thought about this when I was preparing for this interview, but when I was working on my, doing my research on Tim Keller and I went back into his course of study at Gordon-Conwell with, with Elizabeth Elliott, I was reminded that one of the, maybe it was the final assignment, I can't recall, that she assigned in her class on Christian communication was to write about what is, what is manhood and what is womanhood. And this was 1975 or so. And as Kathy Keller and others have told me, it was the hardest assignment. <laughs> wow. That was, that was 1975. Wow. So you're... you're Earlier, I had mentioned how much these things seem to owe to the effects of the internet, and yet, as you pointed out, there are philosophical underpinnings here that go to go back literally centuries with some of the people like Descartes that you've mentioned in here, and so it does appear to be an area that perhaps we were particularly vulnerable to in the West, um, because for whatever reasons, we we simply had not. Um, not sunk into and we're not prepared for for what was was coming there um now this next question may relate um i'm i've had a lot of people ask me all the way from my podcast with my friend kevin de young we had a question at the beginning of the summer about have we reached peak pride you know have, is there going to be that backlash to reality um that, that you had mentioned there uh, from a from a Christian perspective. And then one of the other things that we've seen a lot of lately in conservative media and politics is a lot of discussion about, I mean, kind of stereotypically here, drag queen story hour. And there's also quite a bit of pushback in relation to what you've mentioned, biological men competing against women. So the question for you as a pastor is, do you welcome some of that broader cultural and political pushback? A lot of it's not Christian, a lot of it's not very Christ-like, <laughs> but it is in many ways more in accord with biological reality. It's a bit of that snap back to reality. So how do you think about that as a pastor? Do you say, okay, it's good. We're, there are other allies who are sort of joining this cause, realizing that this is a problem, or do you look at it and say, oh, yeah, I, 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 that they may, we may agree on something, but it seems sub-Christian in some ways. How do you think about that? I, I mean, I, it, I'd have to take it case by case, but I, I think of an analogy with the, the advent of the ultrasound, which helped Christians, it helped the Christian cause to try to say that a baby in its mommy's belly is a yeah. human being, right? Yeah. And so right. when cultural things come along um, that, that help they push in the same direction Christians are trying to push. Um, I think I think we should welcome them without hitching our wagons to them per se. Yeah. Because what's going to happen is you're going to find that there's more of a political um, spirit to some of these things, and and the church right. needs to be careful about how it how it participates in those things. But um, you know, I certainly think when I watch, um, you know, in, in Europe. As I was researching for this this little book, uh, does God care about gender identity? I I, I this was, I realized that how many countries in Europe were dialing back access right. for for minors right. to to um, gender transition therapy in various right. forms, you know, puberty blockers, etc. And I thought that was a great thing, and that was just based on empirical data. They, they were when it was they were not honest, a Christian were, movement. Exactly, they just said, look, it, for, you know. 
for for the sake of the common good and for these young people, we can't say that these treatments are working. We don't know what their effects will be, and young people don't seem to be doing better per se yeah. um, in a way that can justify this treatment. So, right. I I think you know I think you started this question with with talking how you were, you and Kevin DeYoung were asking have yeah. we hit like a peak pride, pride yeah. threshold and. I've wondered that same thing. I live in Washington, D.C., and so when, when Pride Month comes, it's it's a pretty big deal. And I almost felt a fatigue this summer in the city. Mm-hmm. Like, okay, we, <laughs> we, we've we done a lot of marching over the last five years, and, um, you know, we can't, we get it. Um, that's not to say there, there wasn't a lot of activity still. Um, but I, I, do, I do think that one of the ways God has made the world, right, this is Romans 1, is that even in a fallen world, the natural world explains something about spiritual realities, right? That we should know that God exists based on the natural world, right? That seems to be what Paul's saying in Romans 1. And I take from that that reality has its own kind of force upon the human soul and psyche. And you can only cut against the grain for so long. And so I do, I do think you, can, you can't be wrong forever. <laughs> in a sense. So I do think we're going to see a lot of... I mean, we're, we're wealthy enough in the West. We can afford to be wrong for a long time. Uh, you know, if you were poor and in India, you just yeah. couldn't afford to go get a tra- gender transition, right? Because yeah, you have to go get a job. And so this is a luxury of the elite West is what it is. Yeah. Um, yeah. But I do think we'll see... I, I welcome incongruity in as much as it helps us push back towards biblical reality. That makes a lot of sense. Uh, when you're talking with Christians on this subject, your church members or others, certainly when you're thinking about the audience for, uh, for, this, for this booklet, what's the biggest misconception you come across from Christians when it comes to this subject? That's a good question. Um, I think one of the, I, I, it depends what, um, depends what age group I'm dealing with. So if I'm dealing with, you know, Speaking of that book, Generations, you mentioned, if I'm dealing yeah. with uh, a baby, baby boomer or older, the assumption is I'm talking about homosexuality or same-sex oh. attraction. Or, and, and, okay. and I have to very kind of clearly explain to people that the T in LGBT is, is different. It, it doesn't necessarily mm-hmm. mean that someone has same-sex attraction at all. It may have nothing to do with sexual orientation. Um, and so I, it, I always find with Christians in, in older generations, it's important to, to clarify. And, and, and they're not doing anything wrong. They just didn't grow up with all these acronyms. Um, and I think the, the, the biggest misconception I run into with younger Christians and non-Christians, so I'm, I'm lumping them together, mm-hmm. is that this is about a culture war. Uh, okay. that, that pastors that want to think clearly and biblically about gender identity want to have a culture war. Um, first of all, I'm not sure that we really understand what we mean by culture war. I think there's certain wars in culture, like the civil rights movement, that are worth fighting. Sure. Um, but I, th- I think this is not at all what this is. This is about being faithful to God and answering the questions that come to you as a pastor or a parent. And when a young person wants to dye their hair or get a piercing, that's one thing. When they want to permanently alter their body with completely novel treatments, you have a duty to them in God to think deeply about it and speak clearly about it. So I, I, that's what I, I just often feel that with young Christians. Oh, you're just kind of getting into a culture war. And I just want to say, no, I, I, I'm just trying to pastor people and um, and, and really... I have to answer to God one day for how I do that, you know? And, um, and so anyway, that, that's the misconception I see with younger Christians. Let's stay on that pastoral track there, Sam, because this is so much of what we do with the Gospel Coalition and so much of what we're hoping for, um, that church leaders and members of the churches will be helped by your booklet and by others in the Hard Question series. But um, let's talk to parents, and let's talk to parents especially of young children younger children, they haven't yet entered this fray. Uh, what would be something that you think that these parents need to start doing? And what would be something that you think that they need to stop doing? Yeah. 
I just first say my heart goes out to these parents. My church is filled with them. Yeah, exactly. It's filled with them. <laughs> and um, and I love them so much. And I'd say what they need to start doing is thinking about age-appropriate, healthy ways to celebrate gender. So mm. one of the things I try to do in our church is encourage our, our music team um, to do at least one song a Sunday where the men sing a part and the women sing a part. Oh, and then we okay. sing together because that's a that's an acoustic aesthetic way that yeah. the reality of gender difference hits you and it's yeah. beautiful it's one of the reasons gender difference will persist in heaven even though we're not given in sex in heaven we sing a whole lot and you got to have those male and female voices beautiful so so and pointing out you know and, and I know little boys and girls their voices haven't the boys voices haven't sure. changed yet but noticing that I think also again in age appropriate ways and age appropriate is a complex thing now because kids are coming home from school asking yeah. questions about sexuality or earlier is is reminding children that standing behind every one of their friends is one man and one woman even yeah. if the friend has two mommies yeah. only one man and one woman create another human being like it is as much as our modern world wants to create modern families this is another way reality sneaks up on you, right? Even if you're cooking this up in a Petri dish in a lab, women can't produce sperm, men can't produce eggs. And so you've, you've just got this reality to say, God has made it that every little person you see, you can tell this to your kids, has, has, a, has one man and one woman behind them. Um, and that's how God made the world, that, that men and women are real things. And, and so I, I think, parents should think about really healthy ways to point out the goodness of gender. Um, I, I, I tell parents to not um, freak out if their kids don't like um, gender specific play. Um, it's not that big of a deal for a little while. You know, it, 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 don't, don't overreact about that. Um, but um, that's, that's one thing I would say, say to parents. I think, did you, did you have a second question there? I think you just answered it because I said, what do they need to stop doing? And it sounds oh, like your answer is stop yeah. freaking out. Do you have another one? Yeah. Um, I mean, technology. It's like, mm. you know, decades ago, our, our culture realized that nicotine was bad, right? And all the restaurants, you know, I grew up in when I was little, you know, you could, people smoked. Well, you can't, you can't smoke now, right? Why? Because secondhand <laughs> smoke's bad. Right. Well, your kids are breathing secondhand smoke. You hand your kid an iPhone. It's like putting your kid in a restaurant, and although they're not smoking, everyone around them is smoking. And so you have to start realizing secondhand smoke is real. And so I think parents have to think really creatively about tech. We have some families in our church that have intentionally kind of moved in the same neighborhood. Some are doing homeschool co-ops, some are at other schools, but they're... They, they, they pull their families together in friend groups and together they don't give their kids phones. And so their kids aren't the only, you know, 11 year old that doesn't have a phone. And then they find other activities for them to do. But again, I, I, I think the secondhand smoke image is, is the best way to think about what it means for your kid to be able to get onto the internet and look at TikTok, look at YouTube. I mean, look at Twitter. I mean, th these these things are going to present them with an alternative reality, and it's like crack cocaine. I mean, the images are vivid. The people are attractive. They're smiling. They're happy, and they're constant. And there's music playing. I mean, it's it's not a fair fight. And you're just a little kid, you know. It's like, of course, you're going to be influenced by this. So so parents, um, you know, give a kid your don't don't give your kids smartphones or access to technology without really thinking it through. Um, and I know that's really hard, but it's not impossible. Yeah. And a couple more questions here for Sam Ferguson about his new booklet, Does God Care About Gender Identity? Um, this is going to sound maybe to listeners or to you, Sam, as a gotcha question. It's not intended to be one. It's just where we are right now. What about pronouns? Uh, would you honor a request for preferred pronouns in a school? Uh, with your children, with a coworker, how do you think this? Yeah, through? yeah, I'd I'd think it through uh, in different um, contexts. Um, and again, I think families have to think through this. I mean, look, look the 
there's this ethos I feel in our culture right now where we're so afraid to tell a kid something they don't want to he- want to hear. And I, I just want to say, parents, show compassion, listen to your kids, but don't throw, don't give up, don't give away your authority. There, the Bible has a lot to say about the goodness of parenting in an actual structure where parents have authority and kids obey. Yeah. And so the, in the home, 18 and under, I wouldn't encourage using pronouns, uh, different pronouns. And I, I, there are a few reasons. One, you're, you're the mom or dad. Like you, the kids don't dictate the language you use in the house. Two, the, all the studies say that if you practice soft transitioning, soft transitioning is pronouns and um, shifting in dress, that kind of thing. Um, if you practice soft transitioning, you increase the likelihood that gender dysphoria will persist. You don't decrease it. So you think you're, you're using a short-term palliative, which actually is gonna make things harder in the long run. So I, I don't encourage it in the home, but I, I wouldn't, you know, if, if you know, parents get in these situations, and this, this has happened in situations I've been in pastorally, and the, the, the young person says, I'm gonna commit suicide if, if I don't you know, get to transition genders. I mean, that's, that's just a super difficult situation to be in. Um, now I've walked families through that where I've been meeting with the child monthly for a year and, and, you know, I meet with the kid and we do a Bible study and then I walk with the mom to the car and answer her questions. And so I, 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 I let families kind of think that through, but my, 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 you know, the data seems to suggest, I don't think in the long run it's helpful. I think if a parent can say, you know what, if you want to tweak your name, if you want to go with a nickname that feels a little bit more gender neutral. I, I'd be comfortable with that nickname, uh, but please don't ask me to use um, um, pronouns. And I'm gonna say more about the pronouns in a second, but on this topic, yeah. I think this is another helpful thing to tell parents. The kind of um, cap, cultural capital you have now when you're interacting with someone is when you appeal to your identity. So kids will say, this is my identity, it's my gender identity, how can you not respect it? And I think parents should come back and say, but this is my faith identity, and my faith identity has certain implications for how I view gender. So you're asking me to deny my faith identity so I can accept your gender identity, so we're gonna have to at least meet halfway. And this is a process of teaching your kids civility. And, and to say, look, you can't, I have a faith identity which believes in a creator that made your body that roots pronouns in biology. And you're asking me to deny my faith identity right now. And why would you do that? So I think there's an element where, where parents can think through kind of um, creating space for their kids to respect them in this area on their kids' own terms. I hadn't thought about that before, but that's getting back a little bit to what we had discussed earlier with, uh, with, the, with the pronouns of, or with the autonomy, that autonomy is a mirage that we can simply all be free-floating selves. Yeah. Our, our selves are going to inevitably bounce off each other all the time. Yeah. And so it's a way of saying, it's not, it's not a way of reducing our faith to just this identity, but it's a way of showing that you don't get to just pull certain cards and it's, play it, them. It's, yeah, it's, yeah, you want to put the kid in a situation to have to do the very thing to you that they're accusing you of doing to them, yeah. right? So you, you have to say, so you're going to reject my identity right now by making me use a pronoun. That's the kind of, you want to be intolerant, right? So, so you, you start to teach them, we're going to have to meet halfway. It's like two balloons that are expanding that are going to pop each other. It's like right. at some point you have to stop expanding, right? And say, if we're going to live in this room together, um, we can only get so big. Parents need to think through how to kind of draw out some of the inconsistencies in their kids' thinking, to not, yeah. not give up their authority, be loving, listening. And then in the workplace, I mean, look, we're in a secular world. Um, you know, I've been reading a lot in John 14 lately where, where you know, God so loved the world that he gave his only son, John 3.16, but then all this talk in John about the world hating us. I just think you're out, you're out in the world. I think you're going to have to do what your company wants to do or you're going to have to resign. I, I, you know, I walked it, a couple of years ago, uh, walked with a teacher through this who did end up resigning because he didn't want to he, he use the pronouns. And I think that's that's an area of Christian conscience and everyone's going to have to, to, to follow their conscience before the Lord. 
teachers in schools, I, again, you're going to have to see the, your school's policy and decide whether or not, and think it through over the summer, think it through before you take the job. If I'm put in this situation, um, I either need to resign or, or, or realize I'm in a situation where I can go along with this. And I, and I think Christians need to show one another some grace in these situations when they, when they come down differently in the workplace. But this is my opinion. I, I, I'd be very open to hearing you know, some pushback on this. Um, but those are some well, thoughts couple, and pronouns. Yeah, a couple things for me to for, add on that. One of them, and at the Gospel Coalition, we're, we're researching these things right now, but a lot of things related to transgender identities and pronouns and workplace are just now making their way through the courts. And yeah. so it's the same thing we're talking about here, that it's different rights that are colliding. So it does infringe on the teacher's rights at some level if the teacher has to use those pronouns. So we've been seeing a push, especially in recent years with the Supreme Court, that leans toward the ability to be able to abstain for religious reasons from participating in things that go against the conscience. So it's entirely possible that something that may now seem like a make or break, I have to resign thing, because I can't in good conscience do this and deny reality, might be something that even within perhaps a short time, a year, two years, three years, something like that, might reverse to the point where the Supreme Court does not allow schools to be able to require a teacher to do that. So that's just something to kind of stay tuned on. Another thing, I was talking with a church leader uh, years ago, and we were talking about pronouns. And, um, and he was taking a hard stance against um, acknowledging them, using them. My colleague Joe Carter, longtime uh, colleague, you know, there in Northern Virginia with you, he's been a staunch um, advocate of not using pronouns that are not they're not correct because, as he describes, it's, it's it's a denial of reality. And as Christians, we don't deny reality. But one of the things that I've said is, if we're going to take that stance as church leaders, perhaps that is necessary. But if we do. We must be in a position to be able to provide financially and otherwise for our friends and, and colleagues who are in this position. I just find it's often easy, Sam, for you and I to sit on a podcast talking about what should happen when you and I are probably not going to lose our jobs <laughs> over yeah. this. And so that's, I just want church leaders to think through that when they're considering all the different uh, positions is just to say, if, if, you, if you decide this is a really important issue and we do not want to deny reality, we're going to say that we don't, we don't think any members of our church should do that either, no matter what position they're in, be prepared for the consequences, because the consequences may be exactly what you said, Sam, that they will not be able to be in any number of different jobs today, especially those that, that are government funded and affiliated. Does that make sense? It it does make sense, and um, I read a lot of Joe Joe Carter's material. I, I've never met him, but love his stuff. And I, I hear I hear him. I mean, I yeah. in my gut sometimes I just kind of lean in that direction. The hard no, but I think you're exactly right. Pastorally, um, I think we have to recognize the complexity of the situation people people are in. And I I like what you said about the Supreme Court. These things are moving through the courts. It could be. That, that we end up with some air coverage um, yeah. vis-a-vis freedom of speech and religious freedom, and, and that would be a huge boon. There still will be a social cost. Yeah, right? exactly. Like you may not get fired, but you may be the social pariah. Uh, but you're right, Colin. I, I think we need to, and pastorally, it's good to take it case by case and, and avoid too many blanket statements with, with being overly prescriptive, I would say. And we, we have seen this in the last 15 years with... Um, uh, homosexuality related issues. Um, I have some friends who have in in the zeal of their faith have said it's not enough for me to simply sort of let something go. I need to actually confront in the workplace. And in those cases, I, I, I'm not the person pulling back the reins saying, no, 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 don't do that. You don't understand there's going to be a social cost because at some level or even a financial cost, because I'm thinking, I mean, Jesus pretty much promised us that when we tell the truth yeah. about him, the way, yeah. the truth, and the life, people are not going to always love us for that. So I don't want to hold them back. The difference is at the same time, I don't want to mandate every single 
decision they have to navigate in that yeah. in that scenario and that's where I want to allow for that conscience to come in if it's not something that I can find in terms of strategy and tactics that's overwhelmingly obvious from scripture um, you know I, I can only imagine Sam people reading your booklet people listening to this podcast now and and even in years to come uh, many of them will be I think especially church leaders and you know, think about people with the booklet church leaders uh, pastors parents who are wanting desperately even perhaps listening or watching and and hoping for some help but of course we want to come back I think in the end here and think about somebody who's listening or watching and and um, is experiencing gender dysphoria mm -hmm. and why don't you close with a word for that person somebody who's listening watching and say I I feel exactly like that. I feel like I'm trapped in the wrong yeah. body. Yeah, um, I appreciate that question. I mean, for those who do read the book, you know, and if it's not clear already, I, I think to be upfront, I, it's, I don't believe biblically you can ever support a gender transition. <laughs> it, it's not in touch with reality, um, and that's a hard thing to say to someone who feels trapped in their body. Yeah. I think many of the cases today. Uh, particularly with teenagers, are, are um, a manifestation of social contagion. But I have at least personally known one man, actually two, who who had real gender dysphoria from as early as they can remember. And when you you you, you know that's the case when you hear someone who is secretly you know trying on their sister's undergarments or or going into the bathroom at, or, or the dressing room at TJ Maxx to put on women's clothes secretly. Uh, Bruce Jenner was like this, right? If you really understand his pathology back when he was an Olympic athlete, sometimes he'd wear women's underwear under his clothes. And um, mm -hmm. and so if if that's you, I, I just want to say I, I, I in no way understand your pain from experiencing it, but I, I know I've walked with a few people who experienced something similar, and I think it must be brutal. Um, to feel like your body's chafing you, that you're in the wrong skin. Um, but I would simply say, um, you've got to ask yourself the question, what's your pathway towards hope? And my basic thesis is that Christianity has a lot to say to people in pain. I think Christianity makes a case that to be human is to have dysphoria. Dysphoria just means incongruence between the way you feel on the inside and how things are on the outside. Christians speak of the fall, this plunge into sin and brokenness and exile, darkened passions, broken hearts, ailing bodies. And what the Bible will say to you is that the path out of that is not transitioning. It's not changing yourself on the outside. It's transformation. And this is the biblical word, and it's interesting because it uses the same prefix, trans, transformation. Mm. It's the language Paul uses. And that word trans is from a Latin preposition, which just means, means to move into a different state, really to move from pain into wholeness. And the biblical promise of transformation starts on the inside. We're, we're transformed in our inner heart, in our minds. And so it's submitting your heart and your mind to the Lord Jesus who loves you and made you. It's, it's a transformation that promises a ultimate perfecting of the body one day in the resurrection. Paul says in Philippians 3.21 that, that Jesus, he will change, he will transform our lowly body to be a glorious body like his own. And it's a path of transformation that, that is not conducted with a scalpel or in a man-made community. But it's done by the gentle touch of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit that was involved in your creation, that's involved in your redemption. Um, and it's carried out not alone, but in the community of a local church. And so I would, I would just say to someone with gender dysphoria that these deep questions, who am I? Is there hope for me? That Christianity addresses these head on and it tells you that who you are is really whose you are, that you're God's, you're his, his, his son or daughter, he made you, and that he does have a pathway of transformation for you that you can start on today. It's not easy, but it's profoundly deep and it's not cosmetic. It begins with your soul. And so 
it's a gamble for you probably, right? But I don't think the movement of transitioning offers you a high enough ceiling. I really mm-hmm. don't. Um, it's always going to be cosmetic. You're cutting against the grain of creation. And, and humbly, I just want something better for you. And I believe Jesus holds that out. So that's what I would say. And, um, and pray that God would be with you. Amen. My guest this week on Gospel Bound has been Samuel Ferguson from Falls Church Anglican in Falls Church, Virginia. You can read more in his new booklet, Does God Care About Gender Identity? in the Gospel Coalition Crossway series, Hard Questions. We've got we've got bulk copies for anybody who wants to buy copies, read them together with their friends, their church, other leaders in their church. You can find those at the Gospel Coalition store. Sam, thank you for, for navigating such difficult questions with such um, eloquence and grace and balance and ultimately biblical perspective. Thanks, Sam. Thank you, Colin.